Hi, Genetic Innovation students, and welcome to your next lecture in recombinant DNA technology. In this lecture, we will continue to discuss the process of molecular cloning. In the previous lecture, we spoke about how a recombinant DNA plasmid can be introduced into a bacterial host. The vector and insert DNA are restricted with the same restriction enzyme or enzymes and are ligated together to form a recombinant molecule. The recombinant molecule is then transformed into a host organism, which is usually E. coli bacterium. And these bacteria are then grown in order to amplify the plasmid DNA. The next step in this procedure involves selecting for E. coli that have the plasmid with the insert DNA. This diagram shows you an overview of transformation and screening. The process of transformation begins with creating competent bacterial cells, and this is through treatment with calcium chloride in the heat shock method. Recombinant DNA fragments and competent bacteria are then co-incubated, and the heat shock step allows recombinant DNA fragments to enter the bacteria. Following transformation, bacteria that have survived the process of transformation are then recovered, and this step usually occurs by incubating these bacteria in a growth medium or broth called LB broth. Recovered bacteria are then plated on an agar plate and this agar plate usually contains some type of a selective medium. We'll now be discussing what type of selective media an agar plate can contain and how we can select for bacteria that contain the insert DNA fragment of interest. There are two phases of selection of recombinants. The first step is to select for recombinant bacteria. Recombinant bacteria are those who have the vector DNA inserted into them. Selection of recombinant bacteria is usually done by using the marker gene for antibiotic resistance. For example, vector DNA may contain a gene for antibiotic resistance, and the agar plate that the bacteria are then grown on will contain the antibiotic of interest. So if the bacteria had an ampicillin resistance gene or hygromycin or tetracycline resistance gene, these bacteria will then be grown on agar plates containing the antibiotic corresponding to the antibiotic resistance marker in the vector. The second step is to select for recombinant plasmids, and these are plasmids that contain the insert DNA fragment. There are various selection methods that are used to identify recombinant plasmids, and these screening methods are often combined in order to ensure that the insert DNA fragment is present in the vector and has been inserted in the correct orientation. So during the process of ligation, various things can occur. Firstly, we could have the correct insert DNA fragment inserted into the vector of interest at the correct spot, which is within the multiple cloning site. Alternatively, we could also have vectors that have re-ligated, which means the insert DNA fragment has not been introduced into the vector. In the ligation mix, we could also have vector DNA that has the incorrect insert that has been introduced into the vector at the correct site. And we could also have vector DNA that has not re-ligated. Since the entire ligation mixture is incubated with the competent cells, Selecting for the correct recombinant DNA plasmid requires further steps. So how do we then select for the correct fragment? The antibiotic resistance gene is the first marker that is used in this procedure of selection. In the event of a bacterium that does not contain the plasmid, a bacterium that contains the unligated vector, or a bacterium that contains unligated insert DNA, there will be no growth on the agar plate containing the antibiotic. And that's because the antibiotic resistance gene will not be present in the bacterium. In the case of the unligated vector, 
Since there is a copy of the antibiotic resistance gene, the reason that there's no growth on the antibiotic media or selective media plate is due to the fact that this plasmid cannot replicate itself. Since the plasmid is linearized, it can no longer create copies of itself within the bacterial host and is therefore lost during the procedure of recovery. In the case of a vector with no insert, a vector with the incorrect insert that has been circularized and the vector with the desired insert, we will have growth on a plate containing the antibiotic. So the first selectable marker will not be able to differentiate between these three scenarios. And so in order to select for vector with the desired insert, further analysis must be conducted. These selection methods include blue-white screening, positive selection, restriction digestion, colony PCR, and Sanger sequencing. And as I mentioned before, these methods can be combined with each other in order to get a better idea of whether the vector contains the correct insert DNA fragment. The first technique is blue or white screening, also called blue or white selection. In this method, a plasmid that contains a laxed gene within the multiple cloning site is used. The laxed gene encodes an enzyme called beta galactosidase. The agar plates on which bacteria are recovered contain XGAL and IPTG. XGAL is a lactose analog that is cleaved by beta galactosidase. and IPTG is a cofactor that is required for this reaction. When XGAL is cleaved by beta-galactosidase, a blue product is produced. So if the multiple cloning site is placed within the frame of the laxed gene, an insert DNA fragment will disrupt this gene. So if the insert DNA fragment is present, laxed will no longer be functional and beta-galactosidase can no longer be produced. However, if the laxed gene does not contain an insert within the multiple cloning site, beta-galactosidase will be produced, and therefore this will result in the cleavage of XGAL to form a blue product. So bacterial cells with a functional laxed gene that contain a non-recombinant plasmid, or a plasmid without the insert, are blue, and bacterial cells that contain a plasmid that does have an insert DNA fragment appear white on the agar plate. In this way, we can select for bacteria with or without an insert DNA fragment. However, this method does not serve to differentiate between bacteria that have the correct inserted DNA fragment and bacteria that may have an incorrect fragment inserted within the multiple cloning site. This diagram summarizes the process of blue or white screening. A plasmid vector and a DNA fragment are ligated with each other. We could have these possible scenarios. We could have the foreign DNA fragment being incorporated within the laxed gene, and this will result in the formation of white colonies. The insert DNA fragment could also be introduced outside the laxed site. If this is the case, we would have blue colonies on the plate. And if there is no insert DNA fragment, we would also have blue colonies on the plate. So this summarizes how blue-white screening works. The next selection method that we'll discuss is positive selection. Positive selection is very similar to blue or white screening. But rather than using LACZ, it utilizes a lethal gene. A lethal gene is a gene that can destroy the bacterial host. So if, for example, the lethal gene encodes a restriction enzyme that will cleave the host DNA, the host DNA will not survive if a vector that does not contain the insert DNA fragment is present. So if there is no insert DNA fragment to disrupt the lethal gene, the bacterial host will not survive 
and we will not have colonies that grow on the plate. In this way, the only colonies that do grow on the plate would be vector DNA that contains an inserted DNA fragment. This method also does not differentiate between vectors that contain the correct or the incorrect insert DNA fragment. The next method is restriction digestion. Restriction digestion is also used to assess the presence of the insert. Bacterial colonies are picked from the plate and grown in broth overnight in this case. The plasmid DNA is then extracted and a restriction digest is performed on the plasmid DNA. Restriction mapping can be used with various combinations of restriction enzymes in order to determine the position of the restriction sites on the recombinant DNA fragment. As we know what the expected insert DNA sequence should be, these restriction fragment lengths can also be used to determine the orientation of the insert as well as whether we have the correct or the incorrect insert DNA fragment. So this picture shows how a plasmid DNA fragment has been digested after extraction after transformation procedure. In the first lane, we have an undigested plasmid. In the second, we have the plasmid that's been digested with echo R1. So plasmids containing insert and plasmids not containing insert would have different lengths in the linearized vector form. We can also perform double digests and triple digests in order to determine the sizes of each fragment and the position of the restriction enzymes within the fragment. We can differentiate between the correct and the incorrect DNA fragment based on this restriction digestion as well. Because if we use a restriction enzyme that has a restriction site that's present in our insert DNA fragment, we will then be able to use the lengths of these restriction enzyme sequences to differentiate between the correct and the incorrect insert, as well as the orientation of the insert DNA fragment. Therefore, restriction digestion is a very useful technique. However, this technique can be a little bit more expensive than previous techniques described. The next technique which is quite efficient is colony PCR. During colony PCR, bacterial colonies can be picked off of the plate directly and inserted into a PCR reaction mix as they are lysed during the PCR reaction. The primers in this PCR reaction are designed to amplify from either side of the insert DNA fragment. So if we know that our insert DNA fragment has been introduced into the multiple cloning site, we can design primers that amplify on either side of the multiple cloning site. The length of these fragments will allow the researcher to differentiate between colonies that have the insert DNA fragment and colonies that do not have the insert DNA fragment. We can also determine whether the insert DNA fragment is correct based on the size of these fragments. However, if we have an incorrect insert DNA fragment that is a similar length to the insert DNA fragment that we were interested in introducing into the vector, then this method will not be able to differentiate between that. However, it does serve as a very rapid method to differentiate between colonies that do and do not have the insert DNA fragment. This method also does not give you information about the orientation of the fragment. So colony PCR is often combined with other methods in order to ensure that the correct insert DNA fragment is present. The final method that we'll discuss is Sanger sequencing. This is the most accurate method that is used to verify the presence of a recombinant fragment. Bacterial colonies are picked from the plate and cultured overnight. The plasmid DNA is then extracted and sent for sequencing. There are two ways that sequencing can be conducted. Firstly, we can create sequencing primers that are specific to the vector and are located on either side of the insert DNA fragment. So we will be able to sequence just the insert DNA fragment, and this method will allow us to determine both the orientation of the fragment as well as 
the exact sequence of the fragment so that we know that the correct DNA fragment has been inserted into the vector. Alternatively, the entire plasmid can also be sequenced, and this is useful if the insert DNA fragment was introduced into the vector at the incorrect place. And so it can tell us where the insert DNA fragment has been introduced into the vector and if it has been introduced in the correct or the incorrect place and orientation. Sanger sequencing can also be combined with other methods such as colony PCR in order to accurately verify the presence of the recombinant fragment. So this concludes this lecture on selection methods. So now we have learned about how a recombinant DNA fragment can be introduced into a bacterium. It can be replicated. The presence of the fragment can then be verified using these five different techniques, and then it can be extracted to be used in further studies. And this concludes the whole principle of molecular cloning. Thank you.